Amen indeed. Great. Uh, wonderful to see all of you. Great to be here and share with one another. Uh, part of the service today is food. I mean, who doesn't like food, right? So um, part of the service, there's plenty of food. So stick around. So the service doesn't end after my, my, my message. The service continues with sharing of a meal. Let's do that together. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to have a fun little, fun little game, fun little quiz for you uh, when we eat. I'll, we'll see if I can bring that out. Uh, but what I want to talk today about is well-being in weakness. Well-being and weakness. And I want you to start thinking about the Paralympic Games. Are you familiar with the Paralympic Games? So this year we will have the Olympics. Any Olympic jun junkies other than my family? Yeah, all right. Okay, that's all right. You're good. I see you guys. All right, so Paralympic Games are the Olympics for individuals with a variety of disabilities. So some of the most amazing things that I have seen are those individuals in the wheelchair uh, playing basketball. Absolutely amazing. I mean, the athleticism, the health that these individuals require to go out on a court, I, I couldn't keep up with them. And I have two legs. So we have to start thinking about these athletes as at the peak of their performance, at the peak of their health. These are some healthy individuals. The reason I'm mentioning that is because we have to start thinking differently between health and a cure. I'll talk to him more about in just a little bit. But the reason I'm, I'm bringing this up is, is because the text that I have selected for today is in 2 Corinthians. Now, the reason I selected this text is because today we are starting out a series. It's going to be nine, including today, nine Sundays, possibly a tenth bonus one. But nine Sundays that I will cover the topic of mental health. And the idea behind this is we're going to use Scripture as our anchor. We always use Scripture as our anchor. It is what gr uh, uh, grounds us. It is the, the, the bedrock on which the message rests. And next week and the following weeks, we'll be using Psalm 42. And we'll cover that in great, great detail. But today, I want to um, cover 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Not the whole chapter, only the first 12 verses. I will read the text. Then what we're going to do is we'll cover what the text says in its context. We'll talk about how it applies to our 21st century. And then finalize it with some specific action items. So let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to start reading verse 1. I'll go up to verse 12. This particular text is written by Apostle Paul. And then you'll see that the whole context of this text that I'm about to read is in regards to boasting. Boasting. So that's the context I'll cover a bit more about in just a few seconds. Verse 1. I must go on boasting, Paul said. Although there is nothing to be gained... I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was cut up to the third heaven, where there, it was in the body or out of body, I, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I don't know, but God knows, uh, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weakness. Even if I should choose to boast, 
I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest in me. This is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That's what uh, Apostle Paul wrote. So let's talk a little bit about the context of all this. Uh, there was uh, these individuals that came to the church, and, and they were just, well, you know who I am. Let me tell you about who I am, and I've done this, and I've done that. It's almost like they would wear their resume on the, on the sleeves and be like, oh, well, I'm such an important person. Uh, you ought to listen to me. And then Paul is like, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. What are y'all talking about? This, this is not right. Your boasting is, is diminishes who Christ is. And, and let alone, you guys are telling the church a different kind of gospel. That's not right. And people are, well, who are you? Well, I could boast too, Paul would say. But that's not helpful. So in the midst of all this boasting, uh, Paul is, is, is seeking humility. He's seeking exaltation of Christ, not of himself. So he, in other words, he's not playing their game. He's not playing their game. I don't know if you've ever been in a conversation and one person says, you know, oh, I so, so what do you do other than attend a gathering like this? Well, I have my own business. We made three quarter million dollars in sales last week. And um, you feel like, oh, well, well, well uh, uh, well, I, 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 I own my own business too. Oh, oh, or, right? So then all of a sudden it becomes this, <laughs> I am this, well, I am that. And all, no, 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 no. So, so Paul in ministry, Paul is like, no, that is not the right way. We need to seek humility and exaltation of Christ. And then there's this business of a thorn. Right? There's a business of a thorn because he, Paul is saying, look, I have, this, I have this thorn in my side. And we use that expression all the time, right? Ah, that customer was a thorn in my side. Or my sciatica was a thorn in my back. Right? So we got we to gotta, we gotta look at this because people have made all sorts of things out of it that, that quite honestly are like, we left field here all right so we we got to ground this what what is this thorn well first of all the text tells us the purpose of the thorn the purpose of the thorn see this thorn had a purpose it wasn't just a thorn for the thorn's sake and the text tells us that the thorn was there to keep Paul from becoming conceited to keep Paul from becoming conceited. The thorn had a purpose. There's such thing as thorns in our lives that have a purpose. Then we know the place of this thorn. This thorn had a place, the text. And we might breeze over it, but it's important. Because it tells us this, this thorn was in the flesh. Now, I got to tell you, some people say, oh, it's in the flesh. It must have been some kind of sin. You know, that, that annoying sin that comes back? All of us have it, right? That annoying sin that kicks our butt every once in a while. And no matter what we try to do, this annoying sin just seems to have the upper hand all the time. That's not the thorn. That's not the thorn in the flesh. Sin is not the thorn. The flesh it does not... Uh, 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 built on the concept of 
uh, flesh as sinful. No, 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 no. This is plain reading, people. This is, this is just plain thorn in the flesh. Literally, it's in the body. I have to tell you, um, I know the pain that could be caused if you had a big old thorn in the flesh. Um, whenever I have experienced my sciatica pain, it's almost like somebody takes a knife and goes, like, oh, that's a thorn. So some have guessed that perhaps Paul had back issues. Because when you have back pain, it's like, oh, it feels like a thorn. Or it might have been some other ailment on the inside that feel like somebody's stabbing you with a knife. I understand that some forms of cancer pain might feel like a, a knife. Regardless, we know that this is some kind of painful experience for Paul. Because we know the purpose, we know the place, it's in the body, and we know it's painful. The text says that it's real and that it's relentless. Verse 7, if you, you're wondering, where is this all the stuff? It's right here in verse 7. And it's, it's um, uh, okay, here, where is it? Uh, Surpassingly, uh, where am I? Where am I? Here we go. Okay, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh. That's the place. <laughs> and then he goes, well, it's a messenger of Satan. It is. It's just like mosquitoes. I don't know if you realize, but mosquitoes are messengers of Satan. <laughs> At least I think so. All right, so here's Paul getting into some very powerful language. Man, this pain, oh, it's, it's a messenger of Satan. In the summertime, I'm, me, and, me and mosquitoes, the same thing. Oh, Lord Jesus, does Satan create these? No, no, the Lord created, but the, the nature groans under the curse of the fall. So guess what? Now we get annoying mosquitoes. So it's a message of Satan to torment me, Paul says. So this is relentless. This pain is real. It's relentless for Paul. So what does he do about it? Well, it, he doesn't what anybody would do being a follower of Jesus. He prays for, Lord, take this away. Take this pain away. And he tells us he prayed three times. He's very specific about this. In other words, him and the Lord had, had conversations at least three times saying, Lord, you, you got to do something about this. Three times he's praying. He didn't get it. He didn't get it. Not at all. It, it, what he gets is something different. And this is what I was saying earlier, that he was praying for a cure. He's praying for a cure. He didn't get a cure. He got healing. And there's difference between having a cure and being healthy. It, it, the Lord said, look, no, I'm not going to take that from you. You need that thorn. I'm going to give you grace for that. We know the purpose of this thorn, to keep him from becoming conceited. I wish that some of these great, amazing communicators and theologians that didn't live right towards the end of their life, I wish they would have had a thorn. Because perhaps if the thorn would have been there, maybe they wouldn't have become conceited and did what they did. Have you noticed that when you're in pain, you become oh, a little more humble? Yeah? It, when you're in pain, you go, oh, Lord Jesus. You're not like, oh, yeah, I got this. You can do it. Right? Believe in yourself. No, 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 no. It, it, it chops you down a bit. That thorn, that pain, you walk a little bit more cautiously with the Lord. You walk a little bit more humbly with the Lord. When things are going great, who's the man? But when you're in pain, it's hard to say who's the man. 
is you're thinking, Who's, where's the thorn? Oh, it's right here. I felt it again. Or whatever the theme might be. So instead of a cure, the Lord offers him healing, grace. Grace, by the way, that is sufficient. Sufficient. That's hard. But here he is doing all that. And then verse 10 to me, this, this, when we, the verse that we ended, talks about this amazing, I mean, when you read this, you, you get the sense of him being in the sweet spot, the, the well-being of, I don't care about my circumstances. I'm, I'm in the sweet spot with the Lord, and I can, I can handle it. It's, it's wonderful. It's regardless of circumstances, I, I, I'm good. This is why for Christ's sake, I delight. It doesn't say, you know, for Christ's sake, I'm good with, I'll be fine with, I'll survive. <laughs> While back, I, 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 and it's still part of our, you know, family and friends lore. There was somebody in, in the family that would say, you know, you'd ask them, how are you doing? And they'd be fine, but they'd be saying, barely alive. Barely alive. No, you're doing great. <laughs> All right, so Paul is not saying, this is why for Christ say, I'm barely alive in weakness. No, he's saying, I delight. I delight in weakness, in insults, hardships, persecutions, in difficulties. All right, Paul, have you flipped? What's going on here? Have you been, you know, what you've been on? Okay, some good meds, I'm sure. But no, he's saying, because the grace is sufficient in my weakness, I'm healed. In my weakness, I'm strong. Why? Because he's strong. Have you noticed that individuals that have experienced the most difficulties, the most pain, seem to be the most gracious individuals? Richard Wurbrand spent over 20 years in a communist prison because he was a believer in Jesus. He was a friend of the family. I met him on a few occasions. This man had gone through such horrendous experiences. Pain that we can only not even imagine. He was the most gracious, kind individual. In weakness, he's strong. This is what the text says. So what do we do Today, it's been 2,000 years since he wrote this. What do we do? I'd like to apply this text and say the following. I think there's at least three applications. But I believe, based on this text, that God desires intimacy over comfort. Do you understand? Intimacy over comfort. He wants you to be dependent on him. He wants an intimate relationship with you above your comfort. He's not a genie that you rub the lamp and say, now I want a yacht and a million dollars. And I want, you know, plush feathers for my bed so I can live in comfort. Don't forget the mimosa every morning. He wants intimacy. And sometimes intimacy, for us to be driven to intimacy, it requires pain. Remember what I said? That it's not the fact that in my comfort I go, yeah, I'm so self-sufficient. It's when we experience those difficulties that we are driven to him. So I think what's applicable for us today is to remember that intimacy overcomes or overpowers comfort. Intimacy is the goal, not comfort. 
The second thing that we can apply best on the text is what I mentioned earlier, is that there's a huge difference between healing and curing. Huge difference between healing and curing. Friends, pursue healing. Pursue healing because that is so much more meaningful than curing. You might be cured physically, but live an empty life. You might be cured uh, in, in, in your body, whether it's your mind or you might be cured, but without the intimacy of Christ, all is for naught. So pursue healing above curing. I'm not saying don't pray for cures. Please do. That's important. But so much more than cures is healing. And the third thing that I think we can apply right now is grace. Grace is sufficient. Grace is sufficient. The, what is grace? It's the manifest hand of God. How in the world would God give you grace that is sufficient? Sometimes it might be a person walking in your life at the right time, at the right place, saying the right words. As it might be a, a, a co-worker nudging you in a direction. It might be a billboard on the highway. It might be a sign, a symbol in the snow. <laughs> so there's some, there was somebody that said, you know, Pastor, I was walking and I saw this thing that looked like a cross to me. I'm like, oh, really? What was it? And they were describing, and I'm like, how in the world did you make a cross out of it? But hey, somehow, somehow the hand of God opened their eyes, and they saw a cross, in, and, and that was the catalyst for them to come to church. The grace of God. Notice his hand. Paul was smart enough to say, hey, the grace of God told me that it is sufficient. That's all I need, even though the thorn was never taken away. The thorn was never taken away. For all we know, this thorn stayed with Paul until he passed away. So what do we do? Well, here's what we do. Some three specific steps. One, I already mentioned the sermon series coming up, all focused on mental health. Make it a point to be here. Make it a point to be here. If you're online and... You know, you're sick. I understand some people online are sick. Hi, people. Sorry. I know. It's horrible. But grace. You're receiving grace. Maybe you'll be cured, but focus on the healing. There you go. So the series on, on, on mental health starts today. It'll go for eight weeks. We're going to study Psalm 42. We're going to go in great depth of Psalm uh, 42. Be here. That's a very practical thing that you can do. Second thing that you can do, I, um, we sent an email out that said we are starting a mental health class. It's going to be eight weeks. It's going to be limited to 12 people. Okay? And it'll be in January, January 16. Dan is going to tell you a little bit more about it. But it's going to be a mental health class that enables the church to step into that space. Okay? So maybe sign up for that. Um, here's the third action item. Don't ignore the weakness. Don't ignore the challenges. Don't ignore mental health. Acknowledge. Paul acknowledged his thorn, brought it before the Lord. So do not ignore challenges that are related to your mental health. You know, those little annoying things that are happening or what you see around you. Or you might be with individuals that have to live with mental health challenges. This is the time. Do not ignore, but acknowledge and be part of it. So my friends, we'll talk a lot more in the next uh, month and a bit um, about, about this and how the scripture anchors us into well-being, into healing. And we'll cover a lot more about that. I hope you'll make it a, a time to, to be together with that. Next, I'm going to have Dan coming up.
and uh, tell us about what's happening in the church this week and next week. And then afterwards, I hope you'll stick around to continue our, our worship service with some uh, by stuffing our faces. I guess that's the best way to describe that, because there's some good good food here. All right, Dan, why don't you come on up? <clears throat>